Hello everybody, Terrence Lehu here with another episode of the Intellectual Agrarian Podcast, where we talk philosophy from the farm. This is a special episode making it one year since we started the show. To properly commemorate the occasion, we have an equally special guest. When the show was first conceived and named, he was the one farmer we knew that we wanted to interview. Maybe it would take months or even years, but it was a goal that we had set. He's an author, farmer, speaker, and all-around intellectual agrarian. You already know his name because you've read the title of the episode, Mr. Joel Salatin. With Joel, we'll be talking about what got him into farming, how to integrate multiple generations into your business, why he isn't certified organic, and what it means to be an intellectual agrarian. So much more to come. This is a great episode. It runs longer than most of the episodes, but you won't want to miss it. Joel, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Now, I'd like to start out by asking you a very important question. Why farming? Why did you choose to become a farmer? Well, I, um, I grew up here on the farm and, um, and just loved it. Uh, I, I, looking back, uh, I think that a pretty important part of it was the farm that we had here that dad and mom bought was a very worn out farm. And out in the Midwest, my grandfather, who was in Indiana, had a, he didn't have a farm, but he had a very large uh, garden, you know, like a quarter acre, which is a pretty big garden. And uh, it was surrounded by grape vines and a, a T-top grape trellis. And we'd go up there in late summer and these grapes would just be, you know, oozing with abundance as a child. You know, I could reach up and just eat <laughs> all I wanted. <laughs> And, uh, you know, he had strawberries and, and all this. And and um, it was the idea, I, I think, um, just the idea of being able to, to walk out the back, you know, just, just became a, a consuming thing. And, and to know, and then, you know, as I've matured, um, so, so that, that's one very, you know, um, sensory kind of thing, just to, to feel like you're, you're nested in abundance. And the second thing, then as I matured, and I saw our own gullied, worn-out rock pile begin to flourish under our uh, management, then it became the idea that, wow, you mean I, can a- I have the actual privilege of being able to you know, participate, <laughs> to, to participate in moving from scarcity to abundance ecologically. You know, that's, a, that's a pretty profound idea, and, um, and it, just, it still drives me every day. Wow. So what was it that led your family to these sustainable and regenerative practices rather than the conventional ones? Yeah, you know, um, my my grandfather, my dad's dad, uh, was a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine in, I think it was 1949 when that first came out. A lot of Americans today don't realize that there was quite a watershed culturally in the country um, around 19, just say post-World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in, in our area here in Virginia, rural electrification did not come until 1957. So uh, there were still plenty of people farming with draft animals, um, didn't have electricity, and uh, here came all these little bags of chemical fertilizer. And, um, and there were, you know, there were prophets in that day. Rodale was certainly one. Lady Eve Balfour, uh, Ed Faulkner, who wrote Plowman's Folly, uh, Louis Bromfield, who had Malabar Farm in Ohio. I mean, these were, these were those, you know, icons of, of, that, of that period who said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, you know, the soil is not mechanical. It's biological. Uh, you know, we, Sir Albert Howard, of course, he wrote an agricultural testament, which is kind of considered to be the, the, you know the uh, the manual of the early you know uh, regenerative agriculture movement, um, and so there there was a kind of a big you know whoa maybe we maybe we shouldn't ought to do this, and my grandfather was an early adherent to it, and 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 a lot of people don't realize that this you know now we would call it the organic farming movement um, that that there was actually a tussle in, in the culture at that time. There was a tussle. Uh, in agriculture as to which way we would go. And um, 
And the, the ugly truth is that all these stockpiles of, of uh, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, which are used for ammunition, uh, that were stockpiles you know, developed for the war effort, were now cheap, available, easy to sell, easy to, easy to, to, uh, to acquire. And so, uh, you know, if you're a farmer in 1948 and you're either presented where you can do composting, and this is before front-end loaders and black plastic pipe to deliver water and PTO-powered manure spreaders, um, you can either shovel, 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 <laughs> and continue shoveling, or you can put this little bag of stuff on and, it, and it's easy. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I, I slice those early farmers some slack, and, and it shows the you know, the, um, the wisdom of my grandfather, who even at that time said, no, I think I'll shovel. Now, he wasn't a farmer. He was a, he was a large gardener, um, but, but he, he saw this. And there were, there were obviously people in the, in the country who saw it. And so my dad got his, you know, kind of ecological stewardship bent from, from his dad, and, and I got it from him, and so, you know, here you go. So there are multiple generations at play in building up Polyface to where it is today. And at the yeah. moment, you've got your son's running the operation for the most yeah. part. Mm-hmm. What would you say yeah. is one of a few of the key elements of having a multi-generation business in general and farm it specifically? <laughs> yeah, well, that whole successional uh, successional deal is a, is, a, is a great, great big deal. So, yeah, there's a few... There's a few rules. Um, one is to never make work punishment. Never use work as a punishment. Um, work should always be considered a, a privilege and a joy. And um, if you want to, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm all for punishment. I'm not an easy punishment. You know, uh, that, that's okay. But um, but if you say you've been bad, go pick beads and put, pick weeds in the beans for an hour. Um, what's that going to teach you about picking weeds in the beans? Um, yeah. So something something used as so never make work punishment. Um, whatever your and I'm using punishment obviously in a very generic term. Whatever yeah. your your demerit system <laughs> is, okay. Um, whatever that is, don't make it work. Number two um, is to be quick on the praise and slow on the criticism. Um, uh, one of my books I have a chapter good enough is good enough is perfect and um, you know many adults the time you're adults you know you're really really good at washing dishes you're really really good at milking the cow or planting the corn or whatever and when those little hands when those little hands start into it uh, they're clumsy they're unskilled and it's very easy to complain to criticize to be uh, um, to find fault with those little unskilled, clumsy hands. Um, and very quickly, we can take the enthusiasm for the project out by being overly critical. So um, if you want a, you know, an eager beaver 16-year-old, uh, you have to put up with some uh, corn seeds put in the wrong place or too close together or too far apart. <laughs> You know, when they're four, uh, you know, Stephen Covey and his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People start with the end in mind. And so what if we, if, if we want an enthusiastic, um, masterful um, uh, sweet corn planting gal or guy when they're 16, it starts with, you know, a lot of uh, slicing a lot of slack when they're four. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean you don't show them how to do it. It does mean that you're, you're, you know, you're high on praise and, and lower on uh, criticism. And, and I would say if I could just, you know, do three of them here, uh, and I have a whole, you know, I have ten commandments for making your kids love to work with you. Uh, but I'll just hit a third one here, and, uh, and that is to really create a climate where the kids can have their own projects early on, I- including their own entrepreneurial businesses. Uh, I know it was critical to my love of what we do here is I got my first chickens when I was 10. And, you know, dad didn't have chickens. Mom didn't have chickens. I didn't have a brother with chickens. My brother had rabbits, you know. Um, but I had chickens. 
And so I was the chicken expert. You know, when somebody came, wanted to see the chickens, Dad didn't go show them my chickens. He came and found me and said, hey, they want to go see your chickens, you know. And, and um, so to be, to be able to be the resident, you know, the resident guru and the resident owner of an enterprise, uh, at a very, very young age, I, I just think that, you know, between like 8 and 11 years old is just the magic age for entrepreneurism. And um, when I do homeschooling, uh, homeschooling conferences, um, often I'll, I'll ask in a room of, you know, two or 300 people, I'll say, you know, could somebody give me the kinds of businesses that you're doing, you know, eight, eight to eight to 13 years old, what are the, what are the businesses that you're doing? And it's amazing the amount of creativity and, and, and businesses that young people can do. And I think that we've done our young people a great disservice in our culture by, by equating work with abuse, by creating expectation of responsibility with, you know, uh, slavery or heavy handedness, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, if, if you want somebody to launch when they're 18, you got to be preparing the launch pad and a rocket a long time before launch day. Mm-hmm. And, and so, um, you know, we're, we're tickled. You know, our own kids, uh, Daniel started with his rabbits when he was eight. Our daughter started with her, you know, bakery business when she was about seven or eight. Um, our grandkids now are, are now into one of them has uh, sells duck eggs. One of them has sheep and raises lambs, and the other one does um, exotic pullets for backyard, you know, for uh, rainbow backyard uh, chickens. And, and so they all have their businesses. They do their own, you know, uh, balance sheet, profit, loss, and, and, and um, they, don't, they don't get allowances, but they do earn their money with their businesses. And, and, and that kind of affirmation, that self-affirmation that this is, this is mine, and its success depends on me, and it, it's and this this enterprise is an extension of my character, my persona, my gifts and talents. You know that's just that's gold. I mean, compared to okay, so I'm the biggest points getter on Angry Birds. I mean, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's <laughs> really setting yourself up for success there. <laughs> yeah, there's there's no comparison in the you know in the the strength of that uh, of that affirmation. I never used to realize how disparate that kind of perspective is from the modern culture because I grew up on a farm, grew up doing the chores, grew up doing my own part of the business. And now I'm talking like my cousins who's just getting out of college, working on trying to figure out what they want to do. And I'm saying they're going, I already know exactly what I want to do. I've been training for work all these years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the fact that we, that we don't um, encourage our young people to interact, to interact strategically with the adult world, it, it has, has truly been an abuse, I, I think, in and of itself to the young people. I mean, I was, I was out uh, recently. A lady came up to me. She grew up in Washington State. This was, you know, 50 years ago. She said, "When I was growing up, if we wanted to go to the movies or, or go get an ice cream cone." Um, we signed up, they, they had a, this is before internet, you know, but um, in the summertime, the orchard growers, the apple growers, uh, would work out a deal with the local school divisions and, um, and rent the school buses and hire the drivers, and they would have a, a pickup route through the urban and suburban neighborhoods, um, and if you, if you were of a certain age and a certain height, then... If you showed up there at the bus stop, you got on the bus, you went out and picked apples for the day. They paid you in cash. You went home. That's how you. That's how you earn cash. And this was this was typical among the children, you know, 50 years ago. And um, and and the the fact that now we as we as a culture w- would consider that uh, taking advantage of these little munchkins. Um, uh, it, it's no wonder these little munchkins become 18 and they still don't know what to do with their life because they've never been able to grow up and mm-hmm. interact strategically with the adult world. It's, a, it's, quite, it's quite a disservice in my opinion. One of the next questions I had for you is why is Polyface called the farm of many faces? Now, 
obviously poly means many, many faces, but what was the intention of that? Well, the, the intention of it was to just appreciate the diversified enterprises, people, and, 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 uh, and critters, <laughs> for lack of a better word, both plant and animal, that we envisioned ourselves doing. We, we wanted to be, um, we were going to be the, the many-faced farm, and we always uh, put a lot of effort in maintaining the whole uh, diversity. You know, we don't, we don't think that uh, wildlife, for example, should suffer because we have a productive farm. We think that, that, that good farming and wildlife should go hand in hand. Uh, and, and the, the whole, um, you know, the, the intersection of forest land, open land and water, all of those faces. And then you have the, the relation between the animals and the animals, you know, the egg mobile follows the cows and the, the, the pigs make the compost. And, and then you have, you know, complan- companion planting, uh, in the garden, you have, uh, you have, um, uh, you know, relationships between the animals and the plants, the plants and the plants, the animals and the animals. And then you have the whole uh, people component, uh, you know, multi-generational, uh, beyond family, and, of course, you know, family, and uh, our own relationship with the customers. You know, we, I mean, in any given one uh, day, there will be a lot of faces here, faces, customers, you know, uh, that are coming out to buy things. So the whole, the whole um you know, relational aspect of face uh, was, and that it would be uh, many faces, uh, not just you know a single. We think we think so often of a farm as a well, we're a dairy, or we're a beef cattle, or we're a cherry orchard, or we're an apple orchard, or we're a vineyard, and, and we 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 think of farms in terms of terms of, of a single of a single face, a single species, and um, so we knew. We knew uh, early on that we wanted we wanted to celebrate this whole you know diversified um, idea, and that diversification leads to a lot of uh, productive elements on the farm. I was recently at the Acres USA conference, and okay, Andre I hate mispronouncing last names, but Andre Liu, author of yep. the Myth of Safe Pesticides, he was giving a lecture yep. on how diversification on your farm is the first step of preventing the necessity of pesticides because when you have all of those elements working together in the proper relationships, it keeps all of the, we'll say, predatory or diseases or illnesses from having an opportunity to make their presence known on the operation. Yes. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, uh, he's, <laughs> he's exactly right. Uh, the whole, uh, you know, checks and balances thing, um, and, you know, we, we can even take that culturally to us. You know, why one of the reasons America has thrived is because of this, you know, this three-part um, legislative, executive, and judicial uh, branches of government where it's not just a king. Uh, it's, 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 it's all these, uh, and they all are supposed to be, they're supposed to be, you know, equal power, a shared, a shared power structure. And so, uh, you know, that, that's a very ecological idea that um, you know that when the you know when the when the wildebeest get to be too many, uh, then they then the the lions you know the lions um, uh, take them down, and mm-hmm. when the lions get to be too many, then um, some of the lions uh, die because they they can't get enough food, and so this this uh, balance um, among the different uh, elements is absolutely what you know what uh, keeps things sanitary and uh, you know in, in in balance in nature and and so you know if you if you ever thought about you know how do we how could we make the most pathogenic farm possible well you know we just raise one thing we put it as close together as possible we make we put it in an unsanitary situation like a house eliminate the sunshine, um, and we'd make all these things uh, uh, breathe in fecal, fecal particulate from their own manure. And, you know, you go down this path pretty quickly, and you realize, well, well good night. Um, you know, the, the, 
the concentrated animal factory farming situation uh, is a is a perfect you know it's it's a perfect model for encouraging you know pathogenicity. You, we couldn't design a better system for pathogenicity, and so um, so if you you know if you, if you break up and you make it half chickens and half cows or, or you know, do anything you 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 vacate it for a month and put tomatoes in there. I, I mean, it, it, do anything. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of diversification to break those virulent uh, pest host cycles. Mm-hmm. Now, this diversification is one of the hallmarks of uh, the organic farming movement. And your farm, while it's a perfect example of what most people consider organic, you and your farm have chosen very distinctly not to become certified organic. Could you explain to us a little bit of the reasoning why? Well, yeah, there's there are several reasons. One is that if we did, it would compromise our integrity. There are all these certifications have have weird things as you head out the edges of them. Uh, for example, organic certification requires that your compost go over 140 degrees. If we're making compost and we don't measure it and certify that it went over 140 degrees, we can't use that compost. Mm-hmm. Well, um, we don't want it to go 140 degrees because that kills so much stuff. We want all the biology, the enzymes, and all the the little bacteria and fungi and nematodes and things in it to to stay alive, and um, and not and not we don't want stuff to die by sterilization. We want stuff. We want the bad guys to be overwhelmed because we have such a good habitat with the good guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that really only about five percent of you know uh, microorganisms are bad. Ninety five percent are actually good. Uh, and, and positive. So, you know, this is the, the whole terrain theory of well advanced of Louis Pasteur, which of course advanced the germ theory. We got to kill all these things. You know, safety is only in sterilization. And uh, Antoine Beauchamp, who was a contemporary of Pasteur, uh, disagreed and said, no, uh, what makes the, the good guy, the, the bad guys overwhelm the, the good guys? Is an improper terrain. We, we, there's a there's a terrain um, of mismanagement, and, uh, and and so he he developed the terrain theory as opposed to the germ theory, and so uh, for example in compost we don't want this compost to go sterile. We want it to have this prolific diversification of micro organic uh, material in there and beings so that the good bugs overwhelm the bad bugs. So we don't want it to actually go more than about 120 degrees. So it would, it would, it would compromise what we're, uh, the, the integrity of our biology to become organic certified. Uh, so there's, you know, there, there's one thing. Um, there, there are others as well. Uh, it, 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 would, it would preclude us from being able to, you know, to utilize, you know, let, let's, say, let's say you've got a neighbor's place uh, and suddenly things change with that neighbor, and he's got 100 acres that you can use. Well, if we were certified, we have to wait three years to use it. Mm-hmm. But if, if, if we don't use it right now, somebody else is going to take advantage of it and maybe dump chemicals on it and plant corn. And, what, um, and now we've lost it. So, so the timeliness of being able to jump on something, utilize something right now, uh, is 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 impaired. So there 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 are actually some very specific and sound reasons uh, to to not certify. Mm-hmm. Uh, beyond that, though, it, it's a tremendous amount of paperwork. Yes, uh, it's expensive. It's a lot of paperwork. It's expensive, and many of us who are entrepreneurial type farmers and innovators. We don't want to sit at a desk all day. We actually want to make things happen, make the chips fly, you know, move the cows, cut the cut the hay. We actually we actually want to do things. We don't want to sit. So so the certification program actually um, uh, actually attracts attracts the least entrepreneurial and innovative sector of 
of clean farmers to its ranks, mm-hmm. and that's highly unfortunate. But but it's it's part of the nature of the beast. You know, who, who in the world is ever attracted to bureaucracy? Uh, well, <laughs> people, people who have a bureaucratic mindset, right? And, uh, and and so that that's a that's another one. And I, I think the third the third reason is that um, that it has become just compromised and watered down over time mm-hmm. to the point where today uh, they're certifying soilless hydroponic systems where you don't even need soil. And yet the uh, the whole idea of organics, the whole enabling legislation, was about healthy soil growing in healthy soil, and uh, so we're the only country in the world right now that is certifying organic hydroponics. No other country in the world does that, and, and so, um, you know, soilless uh, systems that, are, that have no soil, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and the truth is that you cannot, you simply cannot duplicate the intricacies, the, the strength, the balances of the whole soil food web with basically, a, you know, an IV tube into a plant root. Um, and, you know, Elliot Coleman has done a fair amount of research on this. And, and the difference in the, in the nutrition, um, I mean, yeah, beautiful plants, okay, but, um, you know, beauty isn't everything. Mm-hmm. And you know, um, and so the the nutritive capacity is simply not there, and so we just don't want to as you know as as part of our psyche, we just don't want to go down that hole uh, to play those government games and to put ourselves in a position where we're going to be uh, whatever frustrating and bowing and kowtowing to bureaucrats all the time who are. Um, looking over our shoulder with paperwork. Uh, so we say that we are customer certified. We have a 24-7, 365 open door policy. Not many farms have that. And anyone can come from anywhere in the world, anytime to see anything, anywhere unannounced. Mm-hmm. That's our commitment to transparency. And I don't know a single certified organic farm that has that level of transparency. And so my question is, would you rather hide behind a bunch of bureaucratic paperwork or, um, you know, hide behind your own, you know, your own uh, uh, open source integrity? Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, ta- I'll take the latter. And I always encourage people to know your farmer. I have to admit to you, though, I am one of those uh, people more attracted to bureaucracy. I'm actually an organic inspector on the side, but I totally uh-huh. agree with where you're coming from. Because, and even on this podcast, we've done a lot of criticism on the current state of the National Organic Standards and the allowance of soilless organics. But knowing your farmer is so much more important than any seal anyone can make. The Rodale Institute right now is trying to get a regenerative organic seal off the ground, which I like some of the things they're saying, not certain about its practical applications, but again, I think that knowing your farmer is the most important assurance of integrity that you can have. Yes, uh, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And of course, that immediately moves you to then to so many people who say, "Well, but I, but I don't I don't know what I'm looking for. How do, how am I supposed to know?" You know, well, you have to turn off Netflix and go get involved. <laughs> <laughs> <And> uh, <laughs> You know, look, I wish this were all easy, too. Mm-hmm. Um, wouldn't it be fun if we could snap our fingers and all the things that are wrong would be right? Uh, but that's not the way life is. And if we want a different outcome, we've got to create a different input. And uh, so if you want to, you know, uh, eat better or learn about what to look for, there's a skill and a mastery. There's a mastery of that skill set that takes experience and, and time and practice, just like the mastery of any skill set or playing the guitar or whatever. You know, you you can't you can't Google experience. Nope. Uh, you 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 have to get out there and get with it. And I'm sure in your um, organic farm inspections, 
I'll guarantee you today, um, let's, let's just say that you've been on, for sake of discussion, let's say you've been on 50 farms. Yeah. I guarantee you that today when you step on a place, you, whatever, your radar picks up things even in the farmer's language, lingo, whatever, um, even when you sit down at the kitchen table, that your radar is much more tuned to pick up telltale things now than it was on the first farm you ever visited. Absolutely. And the fact is, today's day and age, we've never had better access to our farmers. With the advent of the Internet, social media, for all of the negative things it brings it's yeah. empowered so many of these smaller farmers to become known and have connections with their local communities. I mean, for goodness sakes, half the towns in America have farmer's markets. There is no excuse yeah. for not meeting a real-life farmer. If you have not met a real-life farmer, it's because you have not just taken the time, gotten off Netflix or Google, and just talked to someone. Yes. Yes, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Never, never before has it been easier to know your farmer, um, but never before have so few people done it. Mm-hmm. Um, be, because because we have so, we have so many other things, uh, you know, vying for our time and attention, and we live, you know, and, and we live in a in a convenient in a convenience oriented, uh, uh, culture where, you know, if it, if it takes much effort, then it's just too hard. I'll go do something else. We hope you're enjoying the special interview with Joel today. And we're just going to interrupt you for a brief moment to share something with you. There are some of you out there that are listening who are farmers and we want to do something special just for you specifically. We've just launched a new website called farmingthedream.com with farmer-specific content designed to help you cultivate the possibilities. We do this by providing you with reviews of important books and ideas that you can apply straight to your farm. Today, if you go there, you can read our review of Joel's latest book, Your Successful Farm Business. Spoiler warning, you should buy it. We'll also have reviews of some of my favorite books from this last year. Learn how their principles can apply to your farm. Once again, all of this can be found at farmingthedream.com or click the link in the show notes below. Also, if you're new to the show, we'd love to send you our top episodes in what we call the grocery bag, knowledge that'll help you choose better and eat smarter. You can get this by clicking the link in the show notes or going to intellectualagrarian.com forward slash bag. Now enough of me talking. Let's get back to our interview with Joel Soliton. I first heard the term agrarian intellectual at, I think it was the 2014 Acres USA conference. You were speaking on an Acres USA economy. And I would obviously have co-opted intellectual agrarian for the show, but I was wondering, how do you define an intellectual agrarian? Uh, What a great question. I enjoy your questions a lot. Um, Well, the intellectual agrarian, of course, it comes from the Jeffersonian, the Jefferson, Jefferson really, you know, pinned the idea that was his um, uh, that was his idea with the the yeoman farmer the intellect, the intellectual um, yeoman farmer and um, and and the idea is that we are we are eclectic we are broad based in our um, intellectual prowess so many times especially farmers um, are not, shall I say, well read, or uh, you know, up on everything from cultural trends to uh, you know marketing trends to political issues, whatever. Um, you know, farming is a pretty lonely, um, you know, a, a, a lonely thing, and it can be very, it can be very consuming. In other words, consuming in that I'm just consumed with my farm and what's going on. Here, so it, it, you can become very uh, insular, and um, and in fact, uh, there's farmers never like to hear this kind of talk. But there have been numerous uh, actual studies um, uh, identifying what's called 
rural brain drain uh, because now for several decades as a culture, we have marginalized uh, farmers. We, you know, if you're an A or a B student, you can go to town, become an attorney, a doctor, a IT professional, you know, and get have you know 401k and a real job. If you're if you're a C minus or less student, then that's fine. You can stay on the farm. And um, I still remember, like yesterday, the last time that I ever was in the guidance counselor's office at the at the high school where I was going, and and uh, she found out that I wanted to be a farmer. And I was, I don't know, junior or senior in high school. And I thought she'd go into apoplectic seizures, you know, and, and she just looked just, I thought she was going to cry. You know, you're <laughs> you're going to waste, you're going to waste your, your, your brains, you know, you're going to wait. And this is ubiquitous in our culture right now. This is ubiquitous. Uh, I mean, we run an intern apprenticeship program and we have parents call and say, look, I didn't send my kid to get a math degree. So they go and work in the dirt. And we have this, we have this incredible condescending spirit in our culture toward um, toward farming and toward the, the, the art and the vocation of farming. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the whole idea of the intellectual agrarian is I want those of us who have chosen this vocation to not let this cultural condescension, um, you know, whatever, waft over our heads, but to step up to the plate Look in the mirror and say, "I am a, I am a landscape stewardship professional." Mm-hmm. What do professionals do? Well, they read widely. They read Wall Street Journal. They read business. They read art. They read leisure. They read fiction, nonfiction. They work on um, you know, intellectual academic stimulation, and um, and 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 I, I and I chide my fellow farmers. And I say, I say, look, you know those. Looking like you're a hayseed blown in from the back forty with bib overalls might might be a cool little shtick, but that is not going to get you treated like a Fortune 500 executive and and get you you know get us where we want to go. Uh, if you want, you will not you will not be respected in culture any more than you respect yourself. So you know you can go down to the thrift store and get a suit, and um, you know where's the where's the farmers market vendor that shows up in a in a suit and tie to sell radishes? Boy, wouldn't that be a change? Wouldn't that be? And, yeah, and um, and I I think that that that's those are some of the nuances of the phrase. This mm-hmm. the big picture. Now, you have as an intellectual agrarian been featured in the omnivore's dilemma food inc is do you think it's because of this wide range of knowledge that you've accumulated from varied reading that has brought you this attention over the years well yeah i <laughs> i think yeah the, you know the older i get the more the more aware i am of how unusual i am <laughs> but um you know my my background uh, you know, instead of playing sports in high school, I was on the debate team and uh, debated all in, interscholastically and then intercollegiately in college. And uh, um, I, I did drama, theater, extemporaneous speaking. I was in the, you know, the forensic arts. The, the, that, and and I'm, I'm not opposed to, don't, you know, like a good football game as well as anybody, okay? But, but I, I think that, um, that, Creating creating a habitat in our home to incentivize, to encourage, to what to bring glory, if you will, to um, you know to the pursuit of of strategic cultural discussion and understanding. Um, I mean, I grew up in a home. You know, Dad was a prolific letter to the editor writer, and so we would discuss um, politics and issues around the dinner table. That was our. You know, today we don't even eat around the dinner table. You just, you know, pop in your hot pocket and you know graze to the next room where the, you know, where um, game of game was it Game of Thrones or Game something? of Thrones, yeah. Electronic. <laughs> I don't even know what these are, but when I stumble over them, it lets everybody laugh and realize how. 
it, it, it's okay to not know something. <laughs> Very true. Very true. And the fact that I'm stumbling over Game of Thrones, um, I hope, uh, is seen not as a liability but as an asset. Anyway, um, the point is that what we want is to create uh, places where we actually stimulate discussion, uh, meaning, meaningful discussion. And I'm not talking about discussing the latest dysfunction in the Kardashian household. I'm talking about basic things. I mean, you read, when you read a Little House on the Prairie books, for example, uh, Little House on the Prairie books, and, and, and think about what, what, what towns did, what cities did for entertainment. Mm-hmm. Imagine, you know, a spelling bee. A, a, a citywide spelling bee. Can you imagine? But, you know, and, and that and that everybody in the town would come out, you know, to to, to see who's going to win the spelling bee this year. Um, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, poetry uh, re- poetry reading contests. Uh, who had the best um, uh, poetry? Uh, you know, the uh, uh, discussion of it. They 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 would stage debates. You know, when there was a political election election, they'd have stand-ins, you know, so-and-so is going to represent, you know, Abraham Lincoln, and so-and-so is going to represent, you know, Douglas, and we're going to, you know, of course, that, you know, the Lincoln-Douglas stuff, but um, uh, is, it, is, it too, is it too much to ask that we, that we um, move to a place of meaningful, thoughtful uh, discussion rather than just Whatever's hip, cool, and advertise and and you know pays for the TV time for the Kardashians. There's so much knowledge out there. They say, I think it's Ecclesiastes, the writing of many books. There is no end. And out of those many books, there are so many great ones. I mean, there are a lot of trashy ones, but there's so many great ones. That's such a disappointment when I meet a farmer who doesn't read who just kind of thinks that it's because he's a farmer, he doesn't have to. Mm. Uh, You're doing yourself a disservice at that point because I I have a pile of farm books that I need to read. Uh, The Myth of Safe Pesticides is one of them. But I'm almost more excited to read the book, uh, The Four, The Hidden DNA of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google because so much of that stuff is important to the farm world, I think, and most Mm -hmm. people aren't thinking of it that way. We get so stuck in these little boxes that we aren't opening up differing ideas. That's where we get Leonardo da Vinci's is through this polymath, this renaissance of ideas. Yes, yes. Uh, I have actually have a, one of the chapters in my uh, most recent book, Your Successful Farm Business. Uh, when I, what I, what I, th- these are just uh, common, you know, commonalities of. Uh, see, one of them is uh, the, the title of the chapter is "Read Eclectically." Um, that's just a highfalutin way to say read a lot of different kinds of stuff. And 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 um, so you're right. We we the the business term for this is we're in our silos, and and we have you know silos, and and so the Democrat never reads what you know the Tea Party says. The Tea Party never reads what you know Bernie Sanders says. And the constitutionalists and libertarians and, and blah blah blah, and you see that politically, we see that vocationally, uh, you know, uh, um, people, you know, people that are you know bankers, bankers don't read, you know, about farmers, farmers don't read about bankers, and and um, you know we tend to we tend to be very very uh, isolated, um, and so I I I am. I'm always excited when I walk in a farmer's home and see, you know, uh, broad material. I mean, I have, I, I get the, the pork, you know, the, the pork industry checkoff magazine. There's nothing in there I agree with. Nothing I agree with. But it's good to see firsthand what the enemy is saying, mm-hmm. what they're saying about us, uh, what they're saying about the future, uh, what they're advertising. And there have been numerous times I've pulled out nuggets, you know, because it, it, it's the industry shill, right? And so I can go straight to the horse's mouth. I can present it to our customers. So, you know, you, 
you guys are just reading Nature Conservancy stuff. You don't have a clue, you know, what the industry is saying. This is I'm not making this up. And they go, oh, oh, oh. they choke and they, you know, wow, how can that be? How can they think that? Well, you know, this might be the guy sitting next to you in the pew at the Presbyterian Church tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And and so it's important for us to um, make ourselves aware of what other people are thinking and doing. You become a more interesting person, and you certainly are able to function better and more meaningfully uh, in the culture. If now you mentioned your latest book, the successful your successful farm business, you've written eleven books. Did I get that count right? Eleven books. Uh, you've also countless articles for Acres USA, Mother Earth News, Stockman Grass Farmer. How do you find time to write? I'm genuinely curious. How do you find time to write? Well, uh, two things are, I think, important to understand. Uh, number one is I am an incredibly fast typist. I put myself through college back in the day uh, typing papers for people. Now, of course, they, probably nobody even does that anymore. There, there isn't even such thing as a typewriter. No, pretty, soon, pretty soon nobody will even know what the word typing means. Um, but, but anyway, um, I'm a very, very fast typist, so I can, I can almost type as fast as I can talk. So, um, so that simply is, is a degree of efficiency. I'm not hunting and pecking. I'm, I'm a very proficient typist. That's, that's one. Number two uh, is that my uh, several years uh, in high school and then um, after college at the local newspaper, being a journalist, um, taught me the discipline of deadlines. And so, and because, you know, you're sitting there, you've got a story, the copy editors, you know, the, the, and, and it's uh, 10 o'clock at night, the press is run at midnight, and he's looking at you saying, I need this in 15 minutes. You can't sit there and say, oh, I have writer's cramp. You know, oh, I, I just, I just, no, 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 he, he you know, he's breathing down your neck, okay? You're going to get axed if you don't get this story in in 15 minutes. So you better get it cranked out, and you better get with it. And I will I will never uh, um, probably appreciate all the, whatever, the, the profound implications of those couple of years working in a, in a daily newspaper newsroom with, with, with deadlines, with expectations, with copy editors breathing down your neck to create this discipline. So the combination of the discipline journalism and the skill of actually banging things out on a keyboard, those two things have worked very well uh, to, to make me... Um, you know, efficient, mm-hmm. and 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 the journalism thing. What that did, you know, because that was in the you know in those days, you actually, you actually composed on a typewriter. I mean, this, I'm talking about a manual tick tack tick tack tick typewriter. Okay, um, and we would type onto, onto paper, and um, and so, you know, you couldn't you couldn't do delete. Uh, you couldn't take out a sentence. You you had to think, you had to think what you were going to say and say it right the first time. Now, you know, obviously there was always editing, but but generally, and that that is a discipline, that is a a skill to be able to have the clarity of where you're headed, so that when you compose it the first time, it goes. I did that my junior and senior year in high school. And, of course, my roommates just hated it and in college that I could sit down at a, at a typewriter and, you know, I'm, I'm two hours from a class and I've got to turn in some paper. And obviously not a very long one if it's just two hours. But I could sit down and literally compose it on the typewriter. This is before computers. Compose it on the typewriter, yank it out, run to class, turn it in, and get an A on it every time. I'm not. I'm not bragging. I'm simply wow. saying that 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 was a gift. That was a gift, but it was a gift honed in the crucible 
of the newsroom that didn't allow room for error. And so you had to get it right and get it straight the first crack. And so all of those things uh, worked together to enable me to, for lack of a better term, say I, I can crank out stuff. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I just can't, I can crank out stuff. And, um, and so it's a, it's a blessing, and I, I, try to, I try to leverage it. Any suggestions for would-be writers out there? Obviously, having a clear idea of what you're trying to say is important. Yes. Well, the single most um, important foundation in writing, I go back to my, and I also had a fabulous uh, 12th grade advanced composition teacher in, in high school, and she was much tougher than anything I ever had in college, and I majored in, Eng- majored in English, okay? So, so this, this lady was something. And she said, she always said, until you can say what you're going to say in one sentence, you're not ready to write. And um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. If you, if you can't boil down your, well, in, in obviously in, uh, in high school and college, we call these um, a thesis statement. Uh, until you have a thesis statement, you're not ready to write, and uh, and that that level of clarity is what you start with, and then beyond that, of course, there are there are lots of rules. Um, I mean, really specific rules like uh, don't write in passive voice, write in active voice. Uh, you know, don't say, you know, he he. Uh, what he had hit the ball instead you know he he hit the ball you get rid of all those passive uh things uh, never use so there t h e r e or very those are all ex- extremely uh weak words that make your writing weak so you write with punch and this is where this is where the combination of reading good material not comic books, but reading good material um, helps you. And and so, you know, a lot of good structure comes as you parrot out good structure that you've been feeding on mm-hmm. verbally, um, whatever. Um, you probably too young to remember the famous newscaster Paul Harvey. I actually do know about Paul Harvey. I <laughs> never, I did, obviously he was before my time, but I have heard about him. God made a farmer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he, he did that one. Um, but he was, he was a, an iconic, I mean, he won every broadcasting award that had ever been invented had a long, uh, like uh, history. I was a teenager and every evening I'd wash my eggs we didn't have a TV. There's, there's one you can do. Get rid of your TV. Um, we never had a TV. So for my, when I was washing eggs in the kitchen sink, um, I would put on. He had a record um, called "The Uncommon Man." This was, you know, this was 1965, 1966, late 60s, and it was the height, you know, the Cold War, um, and and it was, it was about this early uh, kind of entitlement convenience. Um, uh, cancer invading the American ism, mm-hmm. and um, so it was it, the whole idea of it was don't be common. Who want, who wants to be a common man? You want to be an uncommon man. You know that that's what you want to be. And uh, I literally memorized that record. Uh, so I, I go back to, you know, feed yourself good stuff, and you won't spit out trash you know you'll you'll uh, develop just vicarious mentorship if you will you know by masters Mm -hmm. what five books that you have or haven't written so they can be ones you've written ones you haven't would you recommend for a consumer if they're looking to learn more about their food system and the farmers that raise their food oh well um 
for sure folks I mean my my books would be folks this ain't normal mm-hmm. and um the marvelous pigness of pigs <laughs> those are those are the two pretty broad cultural books um and then uh, the final one I would recommend for them is uh, a little short book that I did specifically for consumers called Holy Cows and Hog Heaven. And um, it was a, a food buyer's guide to farm-friendly food. And it's, it's, it's cheap, it's short, it's, you know, uh, to the point. But um, I've had lots of farmers get those and, and, you know, and almost give them out or give them at wholesale to their customers. They say customers are never the same once they read that book. It, it, it's, to, it's to open up our world to, to the consumer, to the non-farmer, so that, you know, she understands um, our world. Uh, what, about, what about other ones? Um, you know, probably a, one that needs to be... Um, talked about today is probably the vegetarian myth um you know we're we're seeing a tremendous amount of of pushback on the whole livestock animal agriculture you know cows are burping and destroying the 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 polar caps that sort of Uh thing and um and i think that that captures a uh there's another one written by um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, uh, but it's it's um, I'm looking here on the shelf to see if I can put my <laughs> eyes on it here real quick. Um, it's it's uh, written by uh, Bill Nyman's wife, um, Nicolette Nicolette Nyman, um, and I. It, it's it's um, it's the case the case for beef or something like that, and um, she is a vegetarian, but she very much appreciates the ecological niche that uh, livestock plays in the in in the overall planetary ecology, and uh, that's a that's a really good one as well. Um, certainly, certainly, omnivores dilemma would be um, you know right up there with the best of the best fast food nation um by eric schlosser you know that's that's uh that's iconic as well well joel thank you so much for being on the show i have taken more than enough of your time where can people learn more about you and your farm well our website is polyface farms p-o-l-y-f-a-c-e polyface farms uh just google that up you'll see a website there and um and there's a lot of information, and we welcome anyone to go and visit that website. You can see there um, all of my books. You can see uh, speaking titles. I, I speak a lot around the world, and, and so if somebody wants to arrange something like that, we can do that. Um, have a gift shop there, and certainly visit, visiting the farm. And... Uh, just lots of good stuff there, so um, take your time on it. All right. Well, thanks again so much for being on the show. All of that information will be linked in the show notes below. Thanks again, Thank you, and have a fantastic day. You too. Thank you so much. Big thanks to Joel for being on the show today. It's such a pleasure to discuss these ideas with any farmer, but especially the man who I borrowed the show's name from. Go out and buy Joel's latest book, your successful farm business. I have read it and loved it. It's great if you're a farmer or not, giving practical small business advice that though applied specifically to farming can carry over elsewhere. All of the links to Joel's farm and material is listed in the show notes. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review letting us know how much you care and share this episode with your friends. Word of mouth is the best recommendation anyone can receive. While you're reviewing the podcast, please subscribe on whatever listening medium you use. Thanks again for listening. This is Terrence Lahue and the Intellectual Agrarian reminding you to keep farming the dream.